thank you all for being here. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Spencer Cradian, and I'm the Director of Programs here at FreedomWorks. We're really excited to have you all here today for this book party, which promotes America in Perspective, written by David Sokol and our own president, Adam Brandon. And a special thanks also to those who are joining us online on the live stream. Uh, this book covers a lot of ground, and we're excited to be having this discussion tonight. Adam and David have both been pounding the pavement uh, to spread the message of America in perspective, but tonight we get to hear from both of them, both on the same stage. Uh, before I introduce you to our colleague Steve Moore, I want to remind you all that you have uh, pens and papers on your chairs, which you can use for questions for the, the Q&A portion of the program tonight. I also want to help set the stage for this discussion by sharing some polling that we've done this month, uh, polling that we've commissioned on the American dream, because that really is fundamentally what the book is about. Uh, we worked with our friend Scott Rasmussen and uh, to find that 58% of Americans say they feel very proud to be an American. 65% say they would rather live in a system in which everyone has equal opportunity to succeed and some people end up successful, which is the definition of a meritocracy. Only 24% prefer a system where the government ensures that everybody experiences roughly the same outcome. So that's the good news. But there are some concerning findings as well. And those get at the threats to the American dream, which is also a, a theme of this book. Only 37% agree that America is a strong force for good in the world. Only 24% are very confident that we have, as a nation, the ability to fix the problems that we face. And fully 42% believe that America's best days have come and gone. So we're looking forward to exploring these types of issues more fully tonight and in the future as we continue to place America in perspective. I also want to say that we're excited to be joined tonight by Emily Jashinsky, who will moderate the discussion. Emily is culture editor at The Federalist and host of Federalist Radio Hour. She previously covered politics as a commentary writer for the Washington Examiner, and before the Examiner, Emily was the spokesperson for Young America's Foundation. She's interviewed leading politicians and entertainers and appeared regularly as a guest on major TV programs. Uh, Emily also serves as director of the National Journalism Center and as host of the Hills Weekly Show Rising Fridays and a visiting fellow at Independent Women's Forum. Originally from Wisconsin, she's a graduate of George Washington University. But first, I want to introduce our colleague, Steve Moore, who is senior economist at FreedomWorks. Uh, Steve communicates our vision for a pro-growth economic agenda and conducts plenty of... Um, this is such a really well-timed book, given the kind of economic uh, massacre that's going on in this country over the last 18 months, and the fact that we've gotten so many of these policies that are supposed to be advancing the American dream, but are achieving just the opposite. We're actually depleting the American dream. We're depleting people's economic prospects by the growth of big government policies. And um, it's almost as if Joe Biden has done exactly the opposite, Adam, of what you suggest in this book. And what what's really so um, exciting to me about this book is it's not just a recitation of all the problems we have, right? We all know we have problems in the political class, the people down the street on both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue. By the way, just this morning, uh, the United States Senate passed a 200, another $200 billion spending bill. You know, can you think of anything dumber than right now spending even more money? And by the way, it passed in a bipartisan way. So our, our uh, congressmen and senators need to read this book as well. Um, I really am appreciative that you guys wrote about immigration because immigrants are so much part of the American dream and they are the people who come to this country literally with nothing and show that the show prove that the American dream is still alive and well. We see, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people come in to our country every year and achieve the American dream with nothing. And so that is really strong evidence that the American dream is alive and well. And we've lived through these. I mean, David, you know this. We've lived through these periods where we feel despair. We feel like the country is in the wrong direction. We lived through the 1970s when we had the last episode of runaway inflation and melees, and it felt like you know America's uh, place in the world had been diminished. And in every one of these instances, that has proven to be not true. We've always, America's always prevailed. We will prevail again. But this is a book 
uh, American perspective that is really the sort of uh, map, <laughs> the GPS map about how we retrieve the American dream and American greatness. It will happen. I feel very confident about it, but I hope that everyone reads this book. Adam, you've been, um, you and I have worked together now for what is about five or six years and built this incredible, um, you know, activist organization with uh, several million activists around the country who believe in freedom, believe in free enterprise, believe in liberty. Um, I, I am, Spencer, concerned about some of those poll results of young people, that they don't seem to have the same kind of appreciation for the greatness of America. So can we please get this, I, I want to see this book um, put in libraries and put in schools so that young people can can read this and learn from it. So congratulations on a great book. It's America in Perspective. Thank you for C-SPAN for covering this. And I will now um, turn it, who do I turn it over to now? Go ahead. Right here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Let's give a round of applause for Steve Moore. All right, well, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, my thanks to FreedomWorks for hosting me and for hosting this conversation that I'm sure will be very lively and enlightening because the book itself certainly is. As somebody who's had the pleasure of reading it, um, I can say it's moving and it includes so many helpful arguments, but with a, a sense of, I think, moral clarity that's missing from a lot of our conversations right now. So I'll introduce our speakers and then we'll dive right in. Our speakers slash authors, I should say. David Sokol, as you all know, is the chairman and CEO of Teton Capital. He has founded three companies in his career to date, taken three companies public, and is chairman and CEO of Mid-American Energy Holdings Company. He sold that company to Berkshire Hathaway in 2000. Mr. Sokol continued with Berkshire Hathaway until he retired in March of 2011 when he left in order to manage his family business investments Mr. Sokol is a member of the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors of the Horatio Alger Association of Distinguished Americans. Over Mr. Sokol's 40-year career, he has chaired five corporate boards and over a dozen charitable or community boards. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. We're joined also by David's co-author, the one and only Adam Brandon, who's of course the president of FreedomWorks. He joined FreedomWorks in 2005 in the press department and gradually moved into a management role. He's responsible for setting the priorities of the entire family of FreedomWorks entities, including a 501c3 foundation, a C4 issue activism effort, and two political action committees. He's been published in and quoted by Fox News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Forbes, and The Hill. When he's not in a suit, as he is right now he can be found watching the Cleveland Browns really That's right. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that the Cleveland Browns with his wife Jacqueline and son Pierce Adam welcome thank you very much and, and because Omaha was getting so much love I just have to point out <laughs> that John D Rockefeller came from my hometown congratulations Adam <laughs> Well, I'll move on to our first question, which is going to be the same for both of our guests. And it is very simply, why did you decide to write this book? We'll start with you, David. Um, well, first of all, I, I, you couldn't put a business person in a less comfortable setting than this. <laughs> um, I, I did want to also just acknowledge we've got a couple of other authors here, and probably many that I'm going to miss, and please feel free to raise your hand, but Stephen Moore, a great economist and, and author as well, and Michael Pack and Mark Paoletta, who just, uh, uh, in addition to the documentary that Michael did, um, created equal, uh, Justice Thomas, in his, in his own words, they just uh, issued a really terrific book that summarizes in his life the other 30 hours of interviews they did on video, and it's a fabulous book. So anyway, thank you uh, for them being here. Um, you know, I, I got to live the American dream. Uh, my grandparents came over from Poland, uh, my dad, when I was a kid, it was always about the American dream. You can do what you want to do. We lived in rural Nebraska, uh, lower income, happy family. We weren't, you know, by today's standards, people would say you're poor, but we didn't know that if we were. Um, but what, what I had was constant encouragement, all five of us kids, um, you got to get a degree, figure out what, de what, what degree you're going to get because it's going to need to create a life for you to pay for your family the rest of your life and, uh, and work hard. And that was, that was it. And on Sundays, he would pass out um, clippings from the local newspaper about successful businessmen and not only what they, and women, but not only what they did with their career, but what they did in the community with, with their philanthropy. And uh, so I, I, to me, it was part of who, you know, who we were. 
And then I got involved with the Racial Algae Association, which, as you know, celebrates people coming up from their bootstrap, pulling themselves up from their bootstraps and, and creating a life in America and, uh, and provide scholarships to scholars. And over the last uh, 18 months or 18 years that I've been involved with Racial Algae, scholars get the American dream. They see it. And these are kids whose background makes virtually anyone I've ever known, they did not have a, a tough upbringing compared to these kids. Um, they're not, they weren't just poor, but you know, parents killed each other. Parents are you know, drug addicts and prostitutes. They don't know them. Kids that live in, in uh, uh, thrown away containers, uh, steel con shipping containers to get through high school. Um, every one of them, they don't blame anybody and they believe in the American dream. But the questions that I on, uh, often get when I meet with the scholars or, or mentor them is, how come our colleagues are, are the kids that we go to school with don't seem to believe in it anymore. And those two things motivated me, that uh, that and the fact that, you know, less than 15% of American public schools teach civics today. That wasn't an option when I was a kid. And in over half the public schools in America, American history is an, is an alternate class. You don't have to take it. And so we've got young people today, I, I can't really blame them when they just read the papers and things to not understand why the mess we're getting into is, is there. Uh, because they, they've not uh, had the opportunity to really learn. Um, and so hopefully this book will give some opportunity for people in a balanced way to understand why America is exceptional. What about you, Adam? You, you say, by the way, you're a Browns fan, but your socks scream Packers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to point that out. I'm from Wisconsin. Uh, okay, go ahead, Adam. <laughs> So w w the reason why I wanted to write this book I was, it goes back to the very beginning, the first notes. Uh, we, you know, you, when you, if you write a book, there's that moment that you take all your notes and you throw them in a folder and you kind of think, what am I going to call this folder? Uh, how about America in perspective? And, and you start gathering other notes. And that was the reason that the working title, which ended up being the final title, was America in perspective, goes back to... We, we, we are just taking all these stories and so much of what David and his experience is mirrored in my own family, although no one in my family has ever taken a company public. Um, a lot of us dream to. Yeah. Uh, but when, when you look at these stories, it's very similar. The people who come to this country and the, and the hardship that they experienced and every great American story is about persevering and, and having hardship and having failure and having to reinvent yourself. And every great, whether it's a sports athlete or it's a business owner, everyone, that's, that's kind of the most common American story. And so when you start looking back through our history, that's just not something that happens today. This has happened from the very founding of the nation. And so when you start putting all of those trials and tribulations in perspective, it's a pretty incredible story. And too often we're, we focus on the negative and you focus on um, what, what is driving people apart and not with that, that basic DNA that unites all of Americans. Uh, this is the most successful multi-ethnic country in global history, period. It's an amazing thing to think when you think about that in light of thousands of years of human civilization. So if you think about it that way, yes, this country has had some rough edges. This country has had some real tragedies. But it's these basic values that we have of meritocracy, rule of law, that has allowed us to reinvent ourselves time and time again. And we're at one of those difficult periods in history where we're kind of doing a gut check moment where you're looking at a lot of our different institutions. And if you keep our history in perspective, what we've been through, it is, it is a map for how we move forward. Well, and there's such an important commonality in what both of you just said, um, in that on the one hand, students aren't even learning the basics of American history, and on the other hand, what they are being taught is completely devoid of perspective. So Adam, I'll start with you on this question. I'm wondering how you think some of these very legitimate threats to the American dream, whether it's our system of higher education, whether it's inflation, whether it's any of these economic problems, how can you talk to people right now who are, are really suffering while balancing that with this message that they're getting from just about every cultural institution that America is somehow irredeemable? Some of the topics we touch on a little bit and something that, that I was raised with is what is this concept of the American dream? And I think too often the whole concept of the American dream we're told is it's a better car than what your parents drove. It's a bigger house than your grandparents have. And when you think about that in, those, in that light, that means the American dream is all about material goods and a material um, uh, approach. 
when I believe the American dream is something larger than that. The American dream is about it's about that freedom to dream. It's about that freedom to chase whatever your heart desires and how you want to build the, your future. And that economic prosperity, that's kind of the, that's a byproduct of when we, when we chase our dreams. What do you think about that, David? Well, you know, I think part of the problem with all of this negative, if you will, uh, attitude is that we've lost the ability to communicate as, as a society. And it goes back to the fundamentals um, that we discuss in the book, you know, the founding fathers spent an enormous amount of time talking about consensus amongst themselves. It took them a great deal of time to decide on 75% approval for a constitutional amendment, two thirds for impeachment, um, uh, you know, the filibuster, 60, 60 votes. They very much understood that, and, and you know, the whole reason we have two senators per state, but, but uh, proportional representation in the House they did not want areas of the country to overwhelm everybody else. And they knew that that would be possible. There'd be large cities, there'd be rural areas. Uh, I mean, these are things you can, you can read about between their letters back and forth and things of that nature. They, it's a government of we the people, which requires consensus. You know, they understood, yeah, okay, we can elect people based on a plurality of votes, uh, but we can unelect them. So we the people control that process. But if we're gonna make major changes to the foundation of the society, it's gotta be on consensus. Therein to me is the biggest mistake we've made. Adam made a comment that we're the, or uh, sorry, Stephen did, that we're one of the only multicultural countries that have ever actually been successful at being multicultural. And we're trying to break that down. We're trying to turn ourselves back into tribes where we attack each other, you know, we, we, we want to create a, a, this myth that we're actually this systemically racist society that we're not, but we're humans. And we've made a lot of mistakes over the years. But what other country went to war with itself and sacrificed 7% of its population to, to stop this scourge called you know, uh, slavery? And so it's that consensus building that we're, we're away from. And, you know, last week, I, I literally, probably one of the most disturbing things I've ever heard a United States president say he stood behind a podium in Massachusetts and said, well, the Supreme Court turned me down, and Congress won't pass what I want, so I'm going to do it myself. That's Russia. That's China. That's a lot of places, but that's not America. And irrespective of the issue, if any Republican president said that, I would be just as appalled. And, and, but that's where we are today, and we've got to get to where we communicate and we get away from name-calling, and, and we, find, we find consensus. And we won't all be happy with it. Um, consensus means, in the case of a constitutional amendment, that, that three quarters of the states have to approve it, which means apparently a quarter didn't if, they, if that's all it was. But that's what we're, we're built upon. And uh, we're, if we don't go back to that, if, if we think that the Supreme Court should be part of the, the uh, House of the, or the Office of the President or something, um, those checks and balances that were put in 246 years ago have been incredibly effective. Um, they do get in the way, though, if one of us decides we should get our way all the time. And, uh, but that's their purpose, actually. Adam, did you have something to add? Well, one, when, one thing that we, were, we talk about in the book about success, and uh, you mentioned that that's you know, slavery, and, and uh, I just love the story that we talked about, about Nigerian Americans. And when you look at statistically about how the, the Nigerian American experience, they're like the most successful subgroup in the entire population. So how can that be that if you have this, this legacy, yet this other group the, the, of recent arrivals are doing just so phenomenally well? And I think what that shows is the power of, of the, the, a lot of folks that come who weren't born here that come here and then take full advantage of the opportunities to chase their dreams. And that shows me the strength of America and the strength of what this country has to offer. So if you, it's just a continuum through history of these opportunities that are provided to folks here. And this is an individual that came here from Nigeria, made an enormous fortune by working hard and being, frankly, very smart. When I asked him about, uh, we were together uh, fishing, and I said, uh, what do you think about American being systemically racist? And he said, well, he said, I'm from Nigeria. He said, it's absurd. He said, your country was formed by Western Europeans that on balance were white. And for a great period of time, that was sort of how the country existed. And, and then you've m morphed into this multicultural melting pot. He said, if you want to see uh, white privilege, forget white privilege, you want to see black privilege, come to Nigeria and try to start a business. 
Um, and, and his point was, he said, that's not to say that, that, that there is necessarily systemic racism in Nigeria against whites, but it's been a black nation since it exi for its existence. And the notion that just because that's the case, um, you're systemic racist is absurd. And that's from a, a Nigerian. I shared the story with Adam earlier today, but I was down in northern Mexico reporting on the border recently, and there was a group of Haitian migrants that was gathered literally almost at the gate of the border. This was in Matamoros, and uh, one of the Haitian migrants, we were asking him, you know, they come from Venezuela and Chile, not necessarily from Haiti, um, why they would risk sleeping on the streets huddled outside the border, outside the gate. And he said the American dream and turned to all of the other, you know, there's dozens of, of Haitians around him. And they all started saying the American dream, the American dream, and the American dream is very alive in other parts of the world, which is what's highlighted by this book through very powerful stories, through very powerful anecdotes. And I wanted to ask both of you if you have a favorite story from the book that illustrates why America is best kept in perspective. Well, my favorite story is, the. how many of you in this room have heard of uh, Robert Smalls? Everyone's hands should be up. This guy, had, this guy should be on the $20 bill. Robert Smalls uh, was a slave. He escaped. He commandeered a boat. He freed himself and a bunch of others, came up north, convinced Lincoln to allow blacks to fight in the Civil War, then became a multimillionaire, founded the Republican Party of South Carolina, and to top it all off, he bought the plantation that he was enslaved in. I mean, I mean that's like an only in America incredible story. And it's such a story of overcoming. It's such a story of, uh, of, of meeting adversity. And it was just a lot of fun to try and take a guy like that, his story. And I mean, this is someone that a movie should be made out of. Yeah, I agree. And in doing a lot of the research, which by the way, Freedom Works was incredibly helpful for us. One of the things Adam and I agreed with was every detail that's in the book has to be referenced. Mm -hmm. um, because unfortunately today, people will tend to think you have a perspective that they don't like and therefore they'll find something to, to, to tear it apart. So we wanted everything. In doing that, as we went through a lot of the research and the history, you realized how we used to, kept using a term self-healing. Yeah. That one of the things that's amazing about what the Founding Fathers created here was this self-healing nature of America to, to, to get at odds with itself and then find a, a, an answer through that. And, uh, and go forward. So uh, to me, that was, it's not a story necessarily in there, but it is the reality that we have this unique form of government and society that, that has been self-healing through these years. Now, that's not to say there weren't a lot of things to heal from. I mean, there's no, you know, one thing we don't gloss over in the book is that there was racism and there was Jim Crow and, and a lot of other things. Um, and those are bad and nobody on this stage is gonna defend them. But we worked our way through them as a society. Um, the one criticism we probably could all have is that it takes too long to, to do those things. But I think that's part of consensus building of multicultural uh, backgrounds, mm -hmm. is you know, we don't all see the same things. We, you know, the fact we have freedom of religion means we may disagree on things that seem pretty obvious to somebody. But, but for religious reasons, we, so we still have to find that consensus. And, uh, but that self-healing piece, I think we should never lose sight of because um, I mean, this is a great country and the opportunities today, I think, are as good as they've ever been. But 30 trillion in debt and running our, our economy uh, the way we're running it, um, it we're gonna end up with a, and I hope we can avoid, too many people have said to me, the only way this gets fixed is if we have a catastrophe. And, I, and, and if, unfortunately, the very people that uh, they get hurt the most are the lowest income and uh, that's, that's the wrong way to solve this problem. And we talk about uh, Argentina, and most people say, no, you should talk about Venezuela. I actually think the Argentinian story is more interesting from an American perspective, because if you go back 100 years ago, Argentina was right there with the United States in all the economic tables. You go back 100 years ago, France, Germany, Argentina, basically the same country. You go back to 1945, well, they weren't bombed. You had your population was all intact. Argentina, they should be in the G7. This should be one of the most powerful countries on earth. And um, they lost it. And they lost it by starting to mess with some of their basic fundamentals. Some of the th They had a lot of the same things that we had, and they lost it. And what that shows me is that, it, that the, the prosperity and the stability that this country has, it's not just something that was ordained to happen. And if you make bad policy decisions, 
you can become the next Argentina. You can actually look back and, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we could be looking back and be like, man, that was the moment when the United States decided they're going to go in this other direction. And then you become a great regional power instead of the, what you talked about, where the Haitians are at the border screaming the American dream. And that's kind of the moment we're at right now is deciding which way we're going to go. Are we going to recommit to the things that, that has always gotten us through, this commitment to a meritocracy, and this commitment to rule of law, or are we going to try and go in some other, more utopian direction and end up just a giant Argentina? Mm. David, you talked about this a bit when you were mentioning how you realized the self-healing nature of our system. This is a great question from the audience. Nonfiction writers often learn a lot when writing their books. What's the most interesting thing you learned while writing this book? And I'll start with you, David. Uh, it's uh, the word consensus. I, I, I was startled to find, I mean, I've always been a, a kind of a history buff on American presidents and the founders and that. But it wasn't until a friend of mine uh, kind of got me to thinking about getting some of the old papers between the founding fathers, the letters. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, there's volumes. He kept every letter he ever received and every letter he ever wrote, and they're printed up in volumes. And, and Adams had similar files. And you go back and start reading these things. They understood exactly what they were doing. They, they, un they, they understood that population – they had population centers back then and that they would try to overwhelm rural thought processes in different religious areas of the country. Um, and that, was, uh, that word is kind of emblazoned inside of me because I just had no idea. You know, we think of them as being geniuses in their own right. Their real genius was as a group because they didn't all agree. And yet they, they, you know, they talked in, their, in several of their papers about how their goal to write the Constitution was to be unanimously agreed on every word. And they effectively made that other than the area of, uh, regarding slavery. Um, and, and you think about that. Think about our Congress today dra drafting a nice letter to somebody and agreeing on every word. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 we've really lost that. And they argued. It wasn't that they didn't argue. But they ultimately found words that they could all you know, make work. And that, so consensus would be the, the one thing that I... One thing I would want to add is something I learned that didn't even get into the book. A few of the staff and I were down and we were working. We had this meeting, and I don't know if you remember this, but we're walking out of your house, and, and I turned to you and I just asked, like, point blank, what's one thing to know if you want to run a successful business? And, and you, without a beat, just say, oh, that's easy. You just fire every pessimistic person on your staff. Now, the car ride back to the airport was really positive of everyone that was in the, was in the car. But what I, I've kind of, that's always stuck with me as, because it does apply to where you're going as a country. It's if, if your country is really negative and down on itself, it is not going to be a success. It is not going to meet its challenges. But when people kind of see that opportunity and that positivity, um, I think that's what that Haitian was looking at. Keep going back to your Haitian at the border <laughs> down there. But I think that's what they were looking for was that positivity of like, I, I'm going to have the opportunity to improve my lot, no matter what is thrown in my way. Mm. Well, we have just a few minutes left, and we have a really great question from the audience. Um, and it's specifically asking about some of the younger people who are in the crowd. And that sense of optimism seems to be such an important, uh, such an important context to keep this in. What is your advice? to the younger members of this audience going forward as they're being told the country is irredeemable, as they're being saturated in pessimism. What's your advice? Well, read this book. <laughs> and, uh, and that, no, I, I, just recognize that we got here as a nation that argues with itself and self-governs. And so the fact that we don't always agree doesn't mean we're bad, doesn't mean the other side's bad. Um, and, and don't let the pessimism get in the way because, it, to me, it is cancerous. It's what's causing our problem. It's not fixing problems. Um, I mean, you know, you take uh, the immigration situation. I mean, I'm just a business guy. I get that. <clears throat> but I got to tell you, I think if, if, if you, we went to not a Browns game, but a Can <laughs> They're a lot of fun. <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs game playing the Browns um, in Kansas City, um, and we threw darts in there and, and picked 15 people. And we got them together and gave them genuine facts, unbiased advisors. They could come up with a bill to rationally resolve the, the immigration situation. Now, that bill would have to go in front of the American people and Congress and that. But 
you know, with all due respect, it's not that complicated. Um, but we've turned it into this, this uh, political tool to bash people with, et cetera. It's things like that. The young people need to understand we need them to demand more of their elected officials. And, uh, and, and that's how you change this, because it's changeable. And, um, it, you know, I think, think, think back, in, for most of us in here, not necessarily the younger folks, but Ronald Reagan changed the attitude of this country in six months. Mm -hmm. from very pessimistic. My first mortgage was 16%. Um, and you think it's depressing to be a young person today. Five and a half percent looks pretty good. Um, but in, in literally in six months, and, and my first vote was for his, his uh, predecessor. Um, uh, because he was an engineer, I'm an engineer, you know, he's going to be logic, he's going to run this country well, and you know what, I think Jimmy Carter perhaps might be one of the nicest people in the country, but he is a horrible president. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you know, optimism, Ronald Reagan's just enormous optimism, and, and his unwillingness to break things down and have 50 fights, he would have one fight at a time. We got to solve this, we've got to get inflation down, um, and we've got to get the economy growing. And uh, he, he didn't pick a fight with everybody. Mm. I think we've got to get back to leadership. We, leadership matters. Um, and frankly, if there, I don't have an answer for it, but we need to get away from the professional politician world that we live in today where, um, you know, the current administration to me is troubling that you, and Steve wrote a, a very interesting piece, uh, but it's obvious when you look at it. This is an administration of identity politics. And, and I, I don't really care personally about someone's gender about someone's uh, sexual preferences and that. I want quality people. In our company, you could be green and walk on all fours, and if you're really good at what you do, you'll get promoted. I mean, that's, that's the nation of, of how we run a business. It's a meritocracy. We have to, you know, experience matters when you're trying to, I mean, you take, take the issue of potentially shifting our entire energy uh, situation from, from our current fossil fuel back, background to, uh, to zero carbon. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I would have every expert I could get my arms around helping me figure out how to do this. Mm. And we don't have, they won't even meet with you. Um, you know, I've been in the energy industry my whole, my whole career. The Obama administration wouldn't meet with you. The Biden administration won't meet with you. They only meet with folks that want to tell them what they want to hear. Mm. Politically, that may be great, but for America, it's terrible. Um, you know, I like the, the old uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, the... Uh, the cabinet of rivals. Mm. Um, get some really smart people with a lot of experience. Um, but that, so young people, to me, they, they're going to be the who have to, have to pick up the mess that we're leaving them. And on a note of young people, the, one of the numbers I like to throw around, and if there's a number that you can remember, it's the year 1983. 51% of Americans were born after 1983. So think of what that means for people and their perspectives. Uh, Berlin Wall came down in 1989. So if you're born in 1983, talking about constructs and all of from, you're going to miss some people in that. So it's important to make sure that we're, there's a whole other audience for us to engage with. Mm. Well, thank you both so much for your remarks and for this wonderful book. I'm excited to bring Spencer Critian back up to the stage uh, to help us continue with the program. Spencer. Well, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Adam and David. And Emily, um, we are going to be uh, doing a book signing with David and Adam right next door in just a few minutes. I just want to take a moment also to recognize a couple of special guests who've joined us, uh, Senator Paul and, and Mr. Larry Kudlow. Uh, we really value... We, we really are, are uh, grateful for your partnerships with, with us, and um, thank you so much for, for your support of what we do here at FreedomWorks. Uh, I will now uh, turn it over to everybody for, um, for the, the book signing and, and reception once again. Thank you all, and thank you to those who joined us online. Thank you, everyone.